you know, if we look at verse 1 of chapter 6 and verse 2 and verse 3, it's, uh, if you look at the whole landscape of Christianity, it's like you're going to find on the first principle that we talked about last week, repentance, a whole bunch of people with a, with a number of different divergent views on what repentance is. And then when you go to baptism, and then when you go to faith, you're going to find a few more with a little bit more radical, divergent things. And then we're going to go to baptism, and then there's more, and there's a few radical. And then you go to laying on of hands, and it gets more. And then it goes to a resurrection, and there's more radical, divergent things. And then it comes to eternal punishment. And there's other ones. And I happen to almost embrace all the radical versions. It's like I'm the, I, everyone else can have one pet thing that they're a little bit off on. And people are like, well, it's just one area. I'm not so sure. I agree with. But I, I happen to just go along with the radical ones and all. And I'm sorry. It's going to get more and more uh, disturbing to some of you as we continue on studying uh, verses 1 through 3 in Hebrews chapter 6. We left off last week's covering the first two principal archies. Uh, of the Christian faith that the writer of Hebrews suggests that we should leave as mature believers. Okay, if you remember that, we recall that we're not leaving them, you know, to die in the wilderness like, an, uh, like a, an animal, a dog that we're abandoning, but that they are essential stones in the foundation of our faith. And once those stones have been placed and understood, and they're placed there, then we leave them and we build upon them. That's, that's more the thinking. So let's read them again. He says in verse 1, chapter 6, Hebrews, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, and the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So he lays out those, those, uh, those six things and says, let's go on. Now, we remember that contextually speaking, the author is advising these longtime believers, those who have been around the church for a while, and we've kind of proven that through the text, that the basics of the faith... Um, ought to be left there, and now they ought to build upon new things to avoid apostasy. That's the whole point. If you remain a babe in Christ, you're going to be hit with meat from the external forces that criticize the faith, and you could go to apostasy is how I read it. We also noted the line that says to not lay again the foundation of these things, but remembering instead that they have been poured, they have set, they have cured by now, so there's no reason to deconstruct the foundation all over again, but to trust that its contents and its placement uh, and its strength is there, and then get on with becoming what God wants us to become, which we're going to talk about in a couple weeks. Now, there's an order and there is a grouping. There's first an order and then there's a grouping within that order that I find ingenious. Uh, it's pretty apparent if you just look at it, but note the order the writer presents. It pictures the chronology that the Jewish convert would go through in their walk of their early Christian life. Uh, he says, first, there's repentance. For a Jew, that came first. We talked about that relative to the Christian last week. And then he talks about faith. Then he talks about baptism then laying on of hands, then resurrection, and then eternal judgment. So we have a chronology there. It says, this is where you start as a babe, repentance. Then he goes all the way through to eternal judgment, ends with that. And he says, let's leave them behind. So all those things form the, the foundation. And the listing isn't by accident. Also, accident. also notice the order contains three ingenious little groupings. First, there's the coming to salvation grouping, um, which includes faith and repentance. That's somebody coming to know the truth. So that's the first two. And then there are church ordinances and administrations of believers, and that's a grouping of baptism and the laying on of hands. So that's the second group within the, the six. And then the third one has to do with doctrines of expectation and anticipation in a believer's life, which he summarized as re resurrection and eternal punishment. 
So he's taken a group and then he's broken them down into kind of three phases of the Christian life. And it's the early Christian life we got to keep remembering. Um, we also suggested that until we have uh, the foundations correct, until they're laid properly, it's tough to build a satisfactory edifice of faith upon them. Um, I'm not sure that you can go on to perfection if those things aren't set. I know individually that's what he's speaking of, but you wonder about it as the church. And I'm not sure that we have ever been established in modern American evangelicalism on what the six things really mean. Again, we have all these divergent opinions, some radical, some conservative, and everyone's saying differently, and they're all building, it seems, a different church. Instead of one faith, one Lord, one baptism, we kind of have one, many faiths, one Lord, and a number of baptisms. And so it hasn't been really established from what I can see, at least in, I think it was, of course, in the early church, and maybe some churches out there have all these things down, but I'm not sure there's been a consistency between the faiths. So you don't want to go and keep pouring, reborn, and rebuilding. We talked about that. Now, I'm not talking about the body here. The body of Christ is perfect. It is made up of believers who have been regenerated, cleansed by the Holy Spirit, walking in truth, and failing too. But it, I'm not talking about the body. There's a difference between the body and the church. And sometimes we liken those and use them synonymously. They're not synonymous. The body is made up of individual believers. The church hopefully is made up of those believers, but sometimes not. But true believers will always serve as his body. But the plethora of divergent churches as a whole certainly gives us pause. I can't tell you how pressing this is upon my mind as we've uh, prepared and uh, gone over these passages to teach. I would propose two things relative to this situation. First, as we said last week, many churches, uh, including what we do here, have misunderstood these six fundamentals. And second, the powers that be have long resisted attempts at reform and instead have maintained an attitude that kind of flourishes today that, look, it all is good, so we don't need to worry. And, and it's Christ's church it's all fine. He will work it out. And uh, Jesus is on the throne. He'll use everything. Uh, and I've heard some of you tell me about, you know, visiting Joel Osteen's uh, thing here in town and, and how he brought you to the Lord. And I realize that, that the Lord can use everything. But um, if that attitude is real and it exists in the church, uh, if it's true, why read the Bible at all? Why study what is what is we're supposed to. Why didn't we just all remain Roman Catholics and just say, you know, Christ is in charge of his church. Constantine messed it up, but God's in charge. We can, and I mean, why not criticize Martin Luther for, for nailing his 96 thesis? And why did Jesus himself express disappointment with five of the seven churches in Revelation saying, with you, I am disappointed. With you, I don't like. You, I am proud of. You who are poor, but rich in faith, things like that. So there is a scrutiny over what the churches do in terms of what is best reflecting of God's will. So, yes, we have rightly embraced the mentality that says he is in control. But I think we've wrongly included in this mentality that because of this, we as believers are not obligated to try and reform our own Christian walk or to pick a church that might more um, uh, strongly represent what the, but the essentials are and other things. So long story short, last week we began to try and articulate a better biblical understanding of these essentials, and I'm sure there's fault in those, which the writer is telling mature Christians to leave with the thinking being that if we can get them down and then move on toward perfection, then we are going to exist in a better, more perfect edifice. So we covered the first grouping last week, repentance from dead works and faith on God. Let's go to the second grouping he presents or what he calls the doctrine of baptisms, plural, and the laying on of hands. And we're not going to be able to get to the laying on of hands because the doctrine of baptisms is going to take up too much time. But we'll get to the laying on of hands in the church uh, next week. The first thing to note is the writer refers to these two items in what I'm calling the administration group as the doctrine of. He says, in, he says the doctrine of baptisms and the doctrine of laying on of hands. 
And he's, he's saying, leave those behind. When he speaks of repentance from dead works and of faith on God, he describes them in terms of our action, of our, of our faith and, 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 and of our repentance being an action. But when it comes to these administrations in the church of believers, he's referring to leaving baptisms and laying on of hands as the doctrines of. He's saying, leave those, those uh, teachings and those instructions about baptism and laying on of hands behind. How come? We know doctrines meet instructions. Theology is a body of doctrine. Theology is the overall view of all the doctrines put together. Doctrines are the individual beliefs on certain subjects, okay? So the writer is not saying leave our personal baptisms or the laying on of hands behind, but to leave the instructions and teachings, all the doctrines about them behind. Why so? I would strongly suggest, strongly, that the author is telling the Jewish reader and us that the modes and models and forms and execution of these baptisms, plural, water and of the Holy Spirit, are not the focal point in the body any longer. But it's the fact that they continue to exist and have a place in the body of believers that matters. So let me explain that a little further. Looking back into the Jewish economy, we find the origin of baptisms, water ablutions, and they had a lot of them, and the laying on of hands by and through priestly authority to ordain and set people apart for office and for religious duty. In the Old Testament, those baptisms were performed physically. Okay, the manner and method and delivery was the focus in this physically based religious economy. You had to be properly dressed. You had to have the proper priesthood authority from, uh, from the tribe of Levi. You had to do all those things the way that it was instructed. And, um, but the delivery of the methods are not nearly as important in the Christian community as the heart behind what is being done. So where the Jews washed or baptized in uh, in a number of ways and used the term relative to a number of different applications, baptizo in the Greek, Christianity primarily now speaks of three baptisms that I can think of primarily, and most people would say there's only two. The first is water baptism. The second is baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you're willing, I think a third is baptism unto suffering. Um, I I see a theme in scripture that those are the three baptisms that Christians are willing to uh, receive, submit to, or whatever. Because there are three, and some will say two, the writer speaks of the doctrine of baptisms, proving that all of them ought to be left where they belong in the foundation of our Christian childhoods. So we'll come back and discuss these baptisms in a minute to ensure we have found a sound, fairly sound biblical view of them uh, before leaving them. The second thing the writer mentions in this administration uh, group is the laying on of hands. And of course, like baptism, laying hands on the head were huge in the old covenant as the priests who had that authority would put their hands in giving blessings, Uh, designating people to offices and in consecrating solemn sacrifices. They even laid their hands on uh, the scapegoat before they sent it out on the Day of Atonement. Well, the first time we find it mentioned in scripture is when Jacob blesses Joseph's two children, Manasseh and Ephraim, and he switches his hands. That's the first time in scripture we see the laying on of hands. And then it is, it pops up throughout the old covenant and we'll see some of it sometimes in the new. We're going to talk about the laying on of hands in church next week. But remember, where the symbolism remains the same and the methods can be similar, it is the spirit and purposes of the acts that matter in the body today, not the delivery and the doctrine themselves. And I sincerely believe that is what the author is trying to say. Don't sit there and kibitz over the doctrines of these things. You've done them. You've received the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized. Get on with it. You know, don't be talking about the sprinkle, the dunk, the throw water in the air and catch it in your mouth. There have been so many crazy forms of this stuff that he's saying, look, don't let that become this doctrine that is going to keep you a child. You've done it. 
You believe it, it's been effective, go on. Another way to view this is as all these practices in the Old Testament pointed to the coming Messiah, when he came and fulfilled the law, nailing the ordinances to the cross, remember, the focus and place of them in the Christian walk can be noted as having meaning in Christ. It's all about in Christ that we have those things and then, le and then we leave them behind. In other words, we understand their symbolism, but we don't make a mountain out of them in our walk. Okay, so let's talk about Christian baptisms in the plural, and I'm gonna talk about only two, not the third that I believe, and that is water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So as noted, the Jews had a bunch of ablutions, washings that were called baptisms. In the Greek, uh, one of the Jews was to wash unthink, unclean things, their silverware, their plates themselves. Another was to prepare priests for service. They would wash them, baptize them, uh, give them ablutions. Another was used when a person converted f to Judaism. If someone was a pagan and, uh, and they wanted to become a Jew after learning and, and studying, they would be baptized in the Old Covenant. So after centuries of this practice, John the Baptist came along, we talked about this last week, and he used baptism in a new way. It was conversion for the Jews, it was to clean for the Jews, all those things symbolically kind of culminating with John the Baptist baptizing people unto repentance. Okay, so that's what this baptism is. It's unto repentance. That was the purpose and symbolism. Those who subjected themselves to it, these Jews were being washed, showing they had changed their minds and the course of their life relative to the law they'd lived under and the Messiah they expected. And they, therefore, they, they admitted to, uh, they submitted to John the Baptist's baptism. Looking back, all of the children of Israel in Moses' time were baptized. They were baptized not unto repentance. They weren't baptized unto Jesus Christ or into salvation. They weren't baptized to be ready to be priests. They were baptized unto Moses. It was when they crossed the Red Sea, Paul talks about this, they left Egypt behind, a picture of our baptism today. They went under the Red Sea along the sides. That Red Sea was dry ground and they were misted. Paul calls that a baptism unto Moses. So it wasn't by immersion, it wasn't by this, it wasn't by, it was a mist. And yet the ground remained completely dry and they came out on the other side now, disciples of Moses who represented the law. So they were baptized unto Moses, now saying we have new life by this law that Moses is gonna lead us into and we've left our old life of bondage behind. A beautiful type and picture for us as Christians today. Okay, so um, we note this baptism by mist delivered in such a way that it wasn't necessarily the form, but it was still considered a baptism. The imagery is one in creating new identity. Imagine a Jew now coming to John the Baptist and just use this as an imagery, because, and I know most of you get this, but some might not, and you're coated in mud. And that mud represents the history of tradition and, the, and how far afield the law had become in your life. And you run into John the Baptist and he says, repent. And he says, I am preparing the way for the Messiah. Repent of your sin and be prepared for him to come. And so John baptized them, brings them up and all that mud is washed away. They have a new identity through that baptism. There's the picture, got it? They are physically seen in a new way, identified now with having repented, okay? Now, Borrowing, maybe even springboarding off this long established practice, Christians too submit themselves to a couple of different baptisms. Listen closely. The writer is telling the reader to leave the doctrines of these baptisms behind now. Leave the teachings and instructions about them behind and go on to perfection. This group, I can talk about this. The morning group, I wouldn't talk about leaving baptism and, and repentance and all those things behind. They're still learning those. I told them this morning, here's where we talk about the, uh, the milk of the word. In the afternoon, we talk heresy. <laughs> so, <laughs> boy, that didn't go over well. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you got to have a place and time. And this is where we're talking about these things a little bit more frankly. 
Of course, the baptisms are viable. They're an important part of the Christian walk, absolutely. But water baptism in the Christian dispensation, since Jesus has fulfilled the laws and ordinances, is not about the mode and method, uh, but wholly about the meaning and symbolism of the act. For this reason, the doctrine, all the teachings and instructions and focus on these baptisms got to be left behind. In other words, once the meaning is known and has been expressed, let it go. So I wouldn't think in a gathering like this, there'd be any need for someone to wander about and say, have you been baptized by immersion? Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? And what manifested that such baptism, sir? Uh, that is the doctrine, the teachings, the instructions. He's saying, leave them alone. If you've done them and you believe them and they were done because of Christ, it's okay. Leave them alone. So, sure, blessing benefit to the individual involved. Yes, it is the public pronouncement, water baptism, that a person has believed and received Christ from the heart as Lord and Savior. But it's just one piece of many in the foundational puzzle of a Christian's early walk. No need to go back and make it, make sure it or they have been done correctly or in the proper way. Now, religions will tell you they have to be. Of course, the men and their institutions love to keep the doctrines of baptism and these other baptisms alive so that they can kind of put stamp a proprietary product uh, stamp on it. This is our baptism. Welcome to the church. We love you as Christ loves you. Have you been baptized by the so-and-so denomination? Well, no, I've been baptized. Oh, in what manner was that? Well, I was, I was baptized by immersion, but my foot came up. Hmm, I think, sir, we need to revisit that. Before the proper baptism here in the doctrines of baptism, talk about, well, I've been a believer for 30 years. Yes, but still, 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 sir. So we have that that constantly goes on. Our church will say, our baptism is required. Or this one, which truly gets to you, have you really been born of the Spirit? Has that truly manifested in your life? Excuse me. Worse yet, individual men and women spend a lot of time arguing if this baptism or that expression of the Holy Spirit is viable, approved of God, sufficient to prove that we are Christian. This places the focus on methods and experience, not on meaning, not on what was in our heart when the thing took place. When a man like Paul thanks God that he baptized nobody, he thanks God, I baptized nobody, water baptism, but a few. Instead, he spent his time teaching the gospel, he said. So we see that they are different. I think we get a fairly good picture of the place water and spirit baptisms have in our Christian walk. First, they are part of the nascent Christian experience symbolic of new identity and a new guide, a new spiritual guide. Oh, it means everything and how you turn from the world. Second, they are beautiful and inviting, frankly, the equipping part of our early Christian development. And God provides them for us. Third, while important milestones and experiences in our Christianity, the method and means of them relative to our own moving on to perfection are really quite limited. So let me personify uh, an automobile for a minute and liken it to what he's saying. For those of you who haven't got it yet, focusing on water baptism would be like a car really, really, really focusing on its paint job. Okay? The car is made for a completely different purpose. And that's why we use the example of the car being completed off the assembly line as teleotes, perfection, because it's made perfectly for what it's supposed to do. But when we focus on baptism, it would be like us constantly focusing on the quality of our paint job. Now, the paint job's nice, and it protects us from rust and things, but it has really nothing to do with the operation of the car, I don't think. And, and so to focus on baptism as a Christian is like a car focusing on the paint job. It gives you new identity. Yes, you've publicly pronounced. Yes, you're a different color. But what does it do to you going on to perfection and actually delivering goods and driving and getting people here and there and picking up and all those things that a car is used for? So using the same analogy, the focus on being baptized of the Spirit would be like a car coming off the assembly line and getting its first full tank of gas. And man, I've got my first full tank of gas. Yes, it's wonderful. It gets all those parts that were put together by God to move forward and start to act. The motor's working. But to focus on the filling of the gas tank is really ridiculous. It's happened. It will be refilled. It has to be refilled for you to move forward. So we don't need to harbor on whether you have ever had gas in your tank or not. You see? 
the point is that none of these things, faith, repentance, water or spirit baptisms, thoughts on resurrection, thoughts on eternal punishment exist in a vacuum. They're present in the Christian walk because they are in and of themselves important, but they are not the Christian walk. None of them are demanded or expected or provided or offered by God because the sun rises and sets on them. He, God wants us to do more. I know that's come through loud and clear. They all play a role in moving fallen yet redeemed men and women forward and toward completeness, completeness in him, but they do not have really much to do with our teleotes, that perfection he longs for. And this is, the, this is the goal. God wants sons and daughters, capital S, capital D, to uh, come to him in perfection, in teleotes. Not, doesn't mean moral perfection. Doesn't mean your flesh is going to do it right. It just means prepared, operating on all cylinders, moving forward along the highway of the Christian life. On proper baptism uh, or examinations to prove that the baptism of the Holy Spirit has taken place, show me somebody who is determined to unearth the status or method of a believer's water or spirit baptism, and I will show you somebody who is focusing on the wrong end of the Christian walk. And that's really what it comes down to. I say this because water baptism, and I would also suggest being baptized by the Holy, Holy Spirit, are really elemental. Children can understand what they mean. That you can, if you explain to a child what baptism of the Holy Spirit is, that means God moves into your heart and you have a new, new voice whispering and telling you how to move about. And being baptized means you are, you are being buried with Jesus who died and you're being risen to new life. And everybody who watches, you, you can tell a child that and they get it. It's so elemental. OK, but men tend, tend to take them and make them inordinately complex and demanding and et cetera. So I've met some pretty intense people who get right up in my grill with eyes accrazed and say, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I want to say, have you? <laughs> I don't understand where this is coming from. What do I do to prove it? How can I prove it to you that I have? What sign do you want me to show you so that I can feel accepted to you and, the, and, and what you've experienced individually in your Christian walk? Well, I want, you to, I want you to tell me about it. What do you want me to tell you? I want you to tell me that, that, to reflect the very same things that I've experienced. I hope I haven't. <laughs> I, I experienced something different. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes to me when I'm doing other things. Sometimes it's when I'm not doing good at all. And that Holy Spirit pours upon me mightily. And it doesn't manifest itself in the way that you seem to be describing by these, by these characteristics and these expulsions of professions. I don't understand those. I'm not sure everybody does. I think a lot of people do them, but I'm not sure they understand them. So what do we need to know about water baptism and spirit baptism as a body of believers so we can understand their place and then get on with it? I'm not going to rehearse my typical explanation of water baptism. We have a book called A to Z. It's free to anybody here. If you want to understand water baptism from a biblical stance using scripture, afterward, there's a box back there. Take one. But we know that water baptism is good of the Lord, an outward manifestation of an inward heart that says, I believe. It's best illustrated by immersion because this typifies our being buried with Christ. Is it always possible? No. Is it, is it best typified by that? Yes. Does God see the difference? I think so. It can be done by any believer at any time on behalf of another believer. And being that it's an outward symbol of an inward faith and showing people publicly that you believe in Christ, it's best done in public. And it's best done truly in the front of people who will be with you in your Christian walk. I went around for years doing open water baptisms. We baptized hundreds of people but they're all reprobates who don't want anything to do with church. And they just want to have the, the Jesus experience, the baptism. Some of them call and say, will you baptize me secretly? That's not what it's for. It's the public profession to show people that you're willing to be buried with Christ, risen to new life. And you say to the world, I have been baptized. And you say to the local church, help me in my walk now. You see, I've committed publicly. Help me. That's what the water baptism is for. Again, I won't go into the Greek, but water baptism is not required for salvation, but is done in preparation for the Christian walk. Hence, we do it in front of other believers. Notice the thief on the cross, who wasn't going to have much of a Christian walk, didn't require water baptism. Hmm, how come? Because he was making his public profession. It was done. The water baptism had nothing to do with salvation. 
And so we have that model there. Had the thief on the cross come down, I would, I would assume water baptism would have been good because he would have further identified himself with other believers that I have to join the body of Christ. All the variables that can come with water, baptism, age, type of water, person baptizing, words used, mode and method are taken in faith before God with a humble heart and then left. So that's water baptism. We come to a very sticky wicket when it comes to the modern evangelicalism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Varied interpretations and therefore ultimate demands often are what make the wicket of stickiness what it is. I know many people who are going to disagree with me, but I would generally suggest that in the first place, any time the Holy Spirit falls upon in or there's an outflowing of the Holy Spirit from an individual upon, in, or the outflowing of, there has been a baptism of the Holy Spirit to some degree or another. The reason I say this is because we are all either guilty or not guilty of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. To be free of guilt from that, we receive what the Holy Spirit says. To be guilty of it, which is an unforgivable sin, means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit and not follow what it is leading us to. So it can fall upon an unbeliever. They have a somewhat of a baptism because it's fallen upon them, and they are going to be held accountable for that Spirit saying, Jesus is Lord, do you receive it? That's why I lump those all in together in the presence of the Holy Spirit. But we could liken the Holy Spirit in believers to being in us only and then to be overflowing from us. Those are the two Greek words to describe it. It can rest upon us. It can be in us, E-N, not I-N, but it means the same thing. Or there can be an overflowing of that Holy Spirit. And this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit many charismatics speak about, is that Greek overflowing, have you had that? Okay. There seems from Scripture to be degrees of presence of the Holy Spirit upon men and women. We can liken the Holy Spirit to water. Some people are very lightly misted with it throughout their Christian walk, and they never, ever experience. Others have experienced in the extremes. Um, others experience a light rain. Some uh, find themselves in a downpour. Others are tossed into a swimming pool of the Holy Spirit. And then others seem to be tossed in the swimming pool and to be drinking gallons of the Holy Spirit at the same time. I mean, it's just like Holy Spirit uh, 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 driven. And, and, I, and I say that because that's what I observe. It's not in mockery. It's just what I observe. May God grant us the humility to receive the Holy Spirit in whatever amount he tends to give us. But I want to make something perfectly clear. The extent and intensity and intensity of everybody's individual experience with the Holy Spirit, listen, is in the hands of God. It cannot be conjured up by us. Jesus made it perfectly clear how the Holy Spirit works. He blows where he wants to go. He moves where he wants to go. And we could no more capture that Holy Spirit and get him to operate in how we want in a group or individually than we can go out and tell the wind today, go now blow to the east. Can't do it. And yet there are those who seem to think that we have it in our control through our faith to harness the Holy Spirit, bring it in and have him do wonderful things because it's our request. The Greeks speak of the Holy Spirit being upon us, believer and not, in us and overflowing from us. On this latter point, many people, the overflowing, especially many charismatics, and I love them. They love the Lord. They, they have a faith in Jesus. They believe in the core essentials. But they can infer that only people who have experienced that charismatic experience have truly been baptized of the Holy Spirit. And I take great uh, issue with that definition. This is not to say the Holy Spirit doesn't overflow at times. He certainly does. And in doing so, marvelous things, unearthly things happen. I'm just not convinced that the overflowing is the only way we can define baptism of the Holy Spirit. In my opinion, anyone who's been born again has been baptized with, by, and in the Holy Spirit. And then it is the Holy Spirit's decision to determine 
how he will work in and through every respective brother or sister in terms of intensity we're talking about. Let me give you an example from my own life. I was born of the Spirit radically in an August afternoon of 1997 <coughs> after a roadside experience. At that moment, I, my heart was changed from being a debased, sinful man to being a forgiven, debased, sinful man. And, uh, uh, and I knew him in a completely different way. I consider that fully to be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then since he has always been present with me, good and bad, and I can pray to have the Holy Spirit more powerfully, but he reigns when he wants to reign and he pulls back when he wants to pull back. I notice his presence more intensely at times in my life, often when teaching, because that's the call uh, uh, of my life, and sometimes when I'm not. But he chooses when to manifest himself in ways mighty and small. I am not one less, one bit less baptized in the Holy Spirit when I'm a dullard sitting on a chair thinking about potato chips than I am when I am teaching uh, uh, powerfully by the Holy Spirit on a concept that the Holy Spirit is witnessing to you is true. I am always, I've always been baptized in that Holy Spirit. He just decides to pour it on here so that maybe others can benefit thereby. It's all just a matter of the intensity that he wants to give. This power is so much in his hands that we can be involved in something totally removed, even sin. Maybe especially in sin. When the Holy Spirit will come and comfort us and bring us back through his goodness to repentance. Instead of that old religious adage, well, I have killed the Holy Spirit. I now have to repent of the specific sin in order to get it back with me. When all we're really doing is make ourselves feel better for the repentance in our flesh and walk about saying, now I feel good. The Holy Spirit doesn't operate that way any more than a parent would operate by not showing up when their kid needs them the most. So I bring this up in an attempt to diffuse the false notion that men and women can control the Holy Spirit and dispel the myth that says only those who have experienced Holy Spirit soaking have been truly baptized by him. See, things become controversial when people suggest that our initial regeneration is insufficient expression of the Holy Spirit and that a more powerful, a higher octane Holy Spirit is out there that you got to get now. All right. So what we have here is we have a baseline here in the center. We have Christian regeneration. You have come to know who Christ is by and through his Holy Spirit. And then we have extremes. We have the soup Nazi of, of the Holy Spirit who says at this end, there is no more Holy Spirit to give. You have enough Holy Spirit. This is it. No more. And then on this end, we have we have a high octane Holy Spirit that you've got to get or else you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But missing the point that the whole thing is Holy Spirit. Sometimes it feels like we get no more Holy Spirit. Maybe God has really pulled from us. He does that for a reason. And then other times he just is overflowing and you're just like, I can't take this anymore, you know. Lord, I don't deserve this. And he's flowing all along that spectrum. We don't need to make a camp. Okay, it all centers on this first one and then it ebbs and flows back and forth to those different sides. The group that talks about there is so much higher octane tends to say you must prove the presence of the higher octane Holy Spirit in you in order to show it's happened. These expressions can be as subtle as really strong feelings uh, I have some dear uh, older women uh, Christian friends who say you have not been approved of God until you have been slain in the spirit, thrown, cast down upon the floor and writhe in the spirit. That is the sign. Others say it's the speaking of tongues. Some say that's not enough. We must laugh hysterically. We must bark in the spirit. And it goes on and on and on. These expressions can be so subtle 
and they can be so overt. Now, while I'm personally suspicious of extremes when it comes to religious fervor, I'm also bored to tears with the conservatives on this end who say, they try to govern the Holy Spirit by saying, well, that's just, that's so out of the ordinary. That would never happen. I mean, so either side is, is somewhat improper. And so what can we say? I think we ought to be able to agree, since we're establishing this foundation the best we can, that all Christians are born again. They receive the Holy Spirit at regeneration. How God manifests that in them is as varied as the individuals who have been altered. Some people are very, sh uh, sh I almost said shy and quiet, very sh uh, uh, quiet and shy. And the Holy Spirit is pouring through them like I'll never experience. And some of them are just very exuberant and need a lot of excitement. And the Holy Spirit might be coming into them as a drop, but it just appears to be. Or it's individual because we are individuals before him. Paul makes it clear when he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Operates on that continuum, but it's just one, not a higher octane. To see otherwise automatically places division between those who have just been born again and those who are operating in the higher octane levels. And that's divisionary, as you know. We note that the writer here in Hebrews tells us to leave the doctrine of baptisms, the teachings, the instructions about baptisms and water and Holy Spirit. Listen closely. If we were in charge of obtaining higher octane Holy Spirit experience. If that was our duty, and that was the thing that really showed we were truly His, I'm not so sure the writer would tell us to leave these doctrines behind. I mean, if it's that important, why would he l throw all this in with infantile uh, Christianity? with being uh, uh, babes in Christ. He would, instead, he would say, now listen, focus on the, the higher octane Holy Spirit. Now that you are away from all these other elementary things, move on, but he doesn't. He includes the whole thing. Look at this, just this. It's the center. Accept it, move forward. What are we to do with passages of scripture that intimate that there are experiences with the Holy Spirit that come in different degrees. For instance, Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist says, As for me, I baptize you with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. There's two things there. The and fire line is how many uh, pushers of higher octane Holy Spirit experience uh, tell us that it's not just being baptized of the Holy Spirit. I would plainly suggest the following, what I've already said. There are times when the Holy Spirit flows. There are times when the Holy Spirit ebbs. We trust in God to work on us appropriately. We walk in faith that has been established. We know we don't control him, but he us. And he flows. There is without question a bestowal of power upon the recipient that cannot be denied. We know it is strong and mighty and uh, it can move just like higher octane fuel can move a car at a much better, faster, cleaner rate, so to speak. Maybe not cleaner, but uh, it can serve to do things, but it's the Holy Spirit's discretion. The, Holy, the, the receiver, however, is not more learned. They are not more worthy. They are not more valuable because this higher experience of the Holy Spirit is upon them. They are just being used by him for his purposes and not their own. Now, that being said, let's wrap this up. I want to give you five kind of tools to consider, just consider, when it comes to observing the baptism of the Holy Spirit and manifestations of it, if they're presented to you. For instance, I walk out of the building to do something, and we have had instances where people are doing a number of things in the, Holy, in the Spirit, in the corner of the room, and, and they're, they're claiming things that are really unique. So how do you tell if it's really true? First, I would suggest is um, what is being done? Does it fit? Is someone praying for someone to be healed? Well, that's biblical. Holy Spirit can move in on someone to heal. Is someone praying uh, in, in tongues? It's biblical. It has a certain 
certain parameters in it. It's biblical if someone is doing that and there's an interpreter there to reveal what the person is saying in that foreign language, it's there. If somebody's prophesying there and saying, I want to say something by the Holy Spirit, I prophesy, that's biblical. All those things, they, they might be a little on the edge of this side of the room, but nevertheless, biblical, we would accept those in the body. Exhorting, loving, or is it something else? Are they bringing stuff in that has not been established in the early church when the Holy Spirit was manifestly present and pouring out? Are things like that coming up? Then you can say, hey, it, passes, it doesn't pass the first test. Does it comply with Scripture? Second one, who is it benefiting from this display of power? The body, the Lord, the individual displaying the power? Who is it benefiting? The third one. The fourth one, who's being glorified? Who receives the honor for this bestowal of the Holy Spirit pouring out abundantly? Is it the Lord? Is it recipients to bring them to Christ? Or is it the person who's doing the healing and the tongue speaking and the everything else that can be claimed? Using these types of tools, we can discern between the works of his Holy Spirit, the work of man, and even the works of darkness, because we will see contextually, uh, well, we won't, I just, I just did something wrong here. Uh, the Antichrist is said to possess great powers and great wonders to do things. So it would be very easy without kind of those rhetorical tools in place to kind of question to ourselves, is that, is that, is that, is that, to be beguiled. And that would be the message of it coming about like that. Next week, we're going to talk about the laying on of hands. And maybe we're going to move into the last two theological discussions of resurrection and eternal punishment. Questions or comments? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. And we pray for your Holy Spirit that as you give it in full measure, that we will receive it as such. And however that manifests itself in our lives due to the spiritual gifts you've given us and want to give us, that uh, it will. And, and that we won't uh, quench the Spirit. We will be open to what you want to give to us and do for us. Uh, we also uh, 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 pray for wisdom and understanding and an ability to operate according to your will and ways and not our own. We, we pray to be in your will, God, and we pray that our focus will be upon you as we do the things that you've created us to do in so many different ways, and that we will move forward in love as Christians, Christ to our neighbors. And for everybody else who is struggling with unseen, unspoken ills and pains, that you will be with them and strengthen them here in our congregation, throughout the body, in the state and nation and world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Bye. Bye. Bye.